I'm going to talk about natural selection and defense regulation. And the big question here is why has natural selection left the body so vulnerable? There are a few things that we didn't talk about in the very first hours of this uh, course, which we probably should have. We haven't given you any real large overview of evolutionary medicine and its different components and how evolution can be useful. So I'm going to do just a tiny bit of that now. The question that got George Williams and I excited at the very beginning was the one of anomalies. Some parts of the body are so incredibly perfect that a Mercedes-Benz doesn't begin to cut it. Look at your heart valves, look at the nephron. I mean, these things are just so exquisitely wonderful. It's no wonder that people find it hard to imagine that natural selection could shape them. Other parts of the body are absolute botched jobs, uh, whether it's the vulnerability to breast cancer or the narrow birth canal or the possibility of choking. Um, it's at least as bad as a Yugo. Um, and the question is, how can we reconcile these inconsistencies between some things that seem so good and other things that seem so bad? This is the general mode of approach for much of the science in this area, is to find anomalies. Um, Mark calls them puzzlers, actually. Puzzlers is a phrase I like a lot, because there's so many things you're wandering. It's like if you go on the top of Mount Cadillac here, and all of a sudden you saw an impala. You would think, what, am I dreaming? There's something wrong here. Or if you go down to the shore, and all of a sudden crawling up on the rocks just by the dock there, you see a shark that has boots on its feet. These are the levels of anomalies that we're trying to cope with and figure out. Now, when I was in medical school, I was told very firmly that natural selection is a random process. You can't expect that much of it. Please just memorize more. In the work George and I have done together, we've tried to simplify things by suggesting that there are five general categories of reasons why the body isn't better. Very quickly, uh, the first two are because selection is too slow to keep up. That is, mismatched with a modern environment, of which you've heard a lot in this meeting. Two, competition with fast-evolving organisms. Thus, it's not surprising we still get infections. The next two are because selection is constrained. There are a lot of things selection can't do. Every trait is a trade-off. There's nothing in the body that's perfect because making it more perfect would make something else less good. Four, there's some things that selection just can't do, like, for instance, transmit the DNA code with no errors. Just can't happen. Starting fresh, it also can't happen. And the last two categories are ones that aren't really natural selection reasons why we're vulnerable, but they're reasons that we as physicians and researchers misunderstand. Uh, the first is that organisms are sh not shaped for health, which is quite disturbing. They're shaped for reproductive success. And the last is what we're going to talk about today, defenses and suffering. Most of the problems people bring to their physicians are not, in fact, diseases. Most of the problems that people bring to their physicians are defenses, because those are the things that are most aversive. Again, just to remind you of the people we owe so much to uh, for developing the foundations of all of this field. George Williams, my colleague and dear friend who's recently deceased. Uh, this is a picture where he and John Maynard Smith and Ernst Meyer received the Crawford Prize in 1999. Ernst Meyer, of course, did so much to teach us about the need for both proximate and evolutionary explanations. And John Maynard Smith took those ideas and also applied them to game theory and many other things. So defenses and suffering. The idea here is these are latent capacities, and Peter has set the stage perfectly, because you can't tell if you have a capacity for sweating until you go out in, in the heat, and all of a sudden your body is sweating. Likewise, if you go out in the cold, you discover all of a sudden that you have this capacity for shivering. You didn't even know that capacity was there until you went in a certain kind of situation. Your body detected that your body temperature is going down and set off a prepared response that's been shaped by natural selection in conjunction with a control mechanism that expresses it in the circumstance in which it's useful. Its expression is regulated, and this is the key to everything we're going to be talking about today. Obviously, it would be possible to talk about those other five, but this is the one that I think is the most relevant clinically, and I think it also illustrates the opportunity for those of us who want to apply evolutionary <coughs> principles in medicine to do things that are not really being done much by the National Institutes of Health. And if you have a, a whole group of people studying evolution in medicine, and they're all doing funded NIH research, 
you're going to get lots of genetics, lots of phylogenetics, and lots of work on infectious disease, but you're not going to get too much of attempting to apply these large-scale principles in ways that clinicians can use. Examples of, of expression regulation, nausea, vomiting, <coughs> diarrhea, and fever, cough, fatigue, anxiety, and jealousy, these are defenses, not defects. I'll just emphasize this once again. Um, what do I mean by a defense or a defect? Um, defects are things where there's something in the body's mechanism that isn't working right. Seizures, paralysis, cancer, pancer, uh, cancer for, uh, paralysis, jaundice, and injury. On the other hand, an entirely different category of problems are defenses. Fever, cough, pain, fatigue, and anxiety are responses that are prepared and ready to go, latent, and they're expressed when the body detects the circumstances where they're useful. Um, a lot of physicians intuitively grasp this, but maybe not enough. Uh, the analogy with the oil light on your car is very instructive. You're driving down the, in the expressway, and the orange light on your dashboard goes off saying, oil pressure low. And you pull into a gas station, and, a nice, and, and you say, listen to the nice young man. He, my oil light is on. Can you help me? And the nice young man says, oh, yeah, I've seen that before. It's not a problem. Uh, I've got a wire snippers here, and we'll just snip that wire so that light doesn't bother you anymore. Um, you know better than that, and most mechanics do too, because that light is there for a very good reason. It wouldn't be there if it wasn't for a good reason. And if you snip it and keep on driving, your engine is likely to be gone quite quickly. And now you keep on driving that your car is fixed, and you, you fix your oil pump, and you go to the, your doctor's office, and you say to your doctor, you know, doctor, I've got this cough, I've got this fever, um, can you help me? And the doctor says, sure, no problem. Here's some cough medicine, here's something to lower your fever, have a good day. It's pretty much exactly the same thing. A good physician, of course, doesn't do that. A good physician first asks a lot of questions about what might be causing the cough and the fever before using drugs that block it. On the other hand, a lot of medicine is practiced just by blocking defenses. And that leads to our next mystery. How is it possible if natural selection has shaped these defenses and if doctors willy-nilly block them using drugs that there aren't just piles of dead bodies outside of the offices of general practitioners. Um, you would think that we'd just be dying like flies because we're interfering with natural mechanisms. And this is a problem that preoccupied me for about a decade until I finally found a way to get at it. The question is how, do, how are these defenses regulated and, how, and the anomaly here, this is the impella on the top of the mountain nearby here, is how, why can we block them safely? Did selection just make a mistake? It's also so important because this is the source of most of life's suffering. Uh, most of life's suffering doesn't come from you know, the, the diseases themselves. Most of life's suffering comes from these defenses, nausea, pain, vomiting, fatigue, and, and all the rest. What about if pain didn't hurt? Pain is the exemplar here of the defensive process. If pain didn't hurt, what then? Well, it wouldn't really be pain, would it? And the experience of pain means there's something bad. But the capacity for pain is an adaptation. So when it's happening, that's not good. That means something's wrong. But the capacity for pain is not the problem. The capacity is a positive, useful response. There have been 35 cases described in the United States of people with a congenital absence of pain. Almost all of them are dead by early to mid-adulthood. And before they die, they get terribly crippled joints because they tend to stand just like this, not moving and wiggling like the rest of us do. And you all might not notice it, but you're slightly wiggling in your chair. This is why you don't get pressure sores on your buttocks, like someone who doesn't have any sensation. So we're going to go back a little bit and talk about defenses in general, here connecting very deeply with what Peter has just been telling you. Um, the first of all, there are a lot of fixed defenses. That's not what we're talking about, but it's important to recognize that natural selection has shaped all kinds of things to protect us that don't need much regulation. Skin, innate immune responses, acid in the stomach, earwax, shedding of cells to get rid of infections and cancer cells on the skin. These are all fixed defenses. Inducible defenses have been studied by basic biologists, very separate from studies of humans, in wonderful ways, especially this work by Tolerant and Harville uh, that I'll show you in just a minute. 
And again, just to repeat, these are latent traits expressed only in a response to a cue associated with some danger or something going wrong. Some of them are developmental changes. That's what Peter Gluckman has been talking about. Some of them were sustained within a lifetime that can come and go. Tanning takes a few weeks to develop, takes a few weeks to fade. Likewise, callus formation. Very short-term temporary ones like physiological defenses, when you run, your heart rate goes up. And when you're frightened, you have a panic response. And then there are emotions. And if there's time at the end, I'm going to make a connection between these physiological kind of defenses and many of the emotions that bring, people bring to psychiatrists, which are essentially the same thing. Most beautiful studies are done on Daphnia, a little organism that lives in freshwater ponds. Um, it swims around get, making its life, but it has to worry if there are predators present. If there are predators present, it grows what's called a helmet. If there are no predators present, it saves a lot of energy and time and reproduces earlier with less energy expended on defenses. This is a classic alternative developmental pathway. And for many years, scientists recognize that if you put the predator in the little laboratory dish with the Daphnia, they grew the helmets. So this leads to a, con the, uh, the proximate mechanism is so interesting now. Um, you, obviously, the Daphnia are detecting the predators, right? Seems obvious enough. Turns out that natural selection has been more subtle than that. Turns out that what they're detecting is not, a, you, you can put the predator in with the Daphnia in the same tank with a screen between, and they don't grow helmets. What's going on here? It turns out that what selection has shaped, the signal for this, is parts of other Daphnia that have been digested by these predators. So it's only when these predators are feeding on Daphnia that the signal is there to develop these helmets. Isn't that lovely? Stress, it, most of my research on neuroendocrinology is based on the stress system. And it just drives me wild to hear people, even sophisticated people doing stress research, talking about the stress response as if it's bad. Well, this is just biologically terribly naive. That response would not be there, except that on the average, it is useful. Um, too much cortisol, yes, causes problems. But too little is called Addison's disease. And if you have too little, a cold is li liable to kill you. Or going out on a hot day is liable to kill you. But this leads to one of these other anomalies. If stress is so useful, why not just express it all the time? Every one of these things needs regulation because it's costly and often dangerous. One answer is that a lot of us do express stress hormones all the time. Um, however, why not do it all the time? Because it takes a lot of energy, it decreases ability to do other things, it damages tissues, and that's the reason why all of the components of the stress response need to be combined into an emergency package to be kept under lock and key until the circumstance when its costs, which are inevitable, are worth it given the potential benefits. Matt Kluger, who used to be at University of Michigan, has done some of the most wonderful studies on fever. And he chose to do them in a marvelous model using cold-blooded animals. Now, you've got to ask yourself for a moment, how can you do studies on cold-blooded animals? But you see how this method gets away from all of the complications of all the physiological mechanisms that increase body temperature in, in warm-blooded animals. He took lizards and injected them with bacteria and then watched their behavior. It turns out that when they're infected, they crawl closer to a light bulb and raise their body temperature by about 2 degrees centigrade. If you don't allow them to crawl next to the light bulb, they die at a much faster rate. So these organisms respond to some signal of infection by behavioral change to increase their body temperature, which turns out to be strongly protective. That's nice. I've looked long and hard for really good evidence about what we should do in the clinic for people who come in with a cold, for people who come in with influenza, for people who come with, with measles and, and mumps. And it, this is a remarkably scattered and unsatisfactory literature. It's an area where anyone here could go off and in one year in a local hospital do a proper study of people who come in with you know, upper respiratory infections, comparing placebo with Tylenol with aspirin and seeing 
um, what happens. There are some studies. They generally show that if you take aspirin during your upper respiratory infection, you shed virus a bit longer and stay sick a bit longer, but you feel better uh, during your, your period of, of illness. For influenza, uh, it's a much more problematic issue. We will have an influenza pandemic that will kill millions of people sometime in the next 10 to 20 years. And there's enormous in, uh, money being put into surveillance networks and attempts to put use drugs that might decrease replication of the virus within you. But the more simple question is, should we block the inflammatory response? Or should we let it take its course because it's useful? This leads us to the question of what kills people when they die from influenza. Is it the influenza organism itself and its or is it the body's inflammatory response? Um, now, there have been about 10 studies in intensive care units on using cortisone and related anti-inflammatories to see if you can save the lives of people who are near death. And pretty consistently, they give mixed results. And the authors say, it appears to be useful in some patients, but not in others. I'm afraid not in one of those articles has anyone actually taken an evolutionary perspective to what's going on here. And I'm going to explain more about what we should expect in that based on a mathematical model in a moment. In the meanwhile, fever is still a mystery. Um, it's very obvious that fever is an adaptation. The reason we know that for sure is that it's not just metabolism being cranked up, putting more calories through the system and, and more oxidative heat generated. It's a different set point that's defended. The body notches that set point up a couple of degrees, and it still defends it, up or down, whether you are in a cold or a hot environment. So there, there's something changed about the set point. It's not just cranking up fever. And anything that's regulated like that, especially, you know, then, then you know there's an adaptation because natural selection can't shape a regulatory mechanism unless the thing that's being regulated is functional somehow. So this is the question I've asked myself for another 20 years. So does high body temperature really kill pathogens? And, you know, E. coli grow very nicely at 100 degrees or 102 degrees. Um, so do lots of other pathogens. Um, is this, this really what's going on? And it, it just never quite made sense to me. And the next slide I'm going to show you is from a paper that I should have written a few years ago and didn't. And maybe someone here would like to, to collaborate on such a paper. But I finally, happenstance reading, came across something that made a light bulb go on. And this was the paper. It was about fever and heat shock proteins, and where these folks in PNAS a few years ago said, increased temperature results in the activation of a conserved pathway. This is in C. elegans, a tiny soil worm. Conserved heat shock transcription factor that enhances immunity in the invertebrate C. elegans. Heat shock factor one is required for C. elegans immunity against Pseudomonas, uh, Salmonella, Yersinia, and Enterococcus, indicating that heat shock factor one is part of a multi-pathogen defense pathway. So this leads me to a hypothesis that I'm quite enamored of, which is that perhaps the reason fever um, is useful in controlling infection is not because the high body temperature is useful at all, at all, but because natural selection has been severely constrained by path dependence all the way back to the origins of defense against pathogens, to a system that, adju that adjusts the system to cope with pathogens by cranking up body temperature. And Carl has made me think a lot about this as well, because he talks about how any biochemical system can be subverted by pathogens. This might be a way of controlling the whole inflammatory response and, and setting it to a mode that deals well with pathogens in a way that makes it less vulnerable to subversion by pathogens. Or it might just be that path dependence has made this the mechanism that controls that system right from the beginning, and we're stuck with using it. The opportunities in, for pharmacologic development seem to be huge here. If we could find out exactly what higher body temperature is doing in terms of which suite of things are aroused, that might lead us to different ways of simulating the benefits of temperature without the high temperature itself. So this is a hypothesis to summarize. It's an adaptive response, severely distrained by path dependence because it uses temperature to induce multiple responses useful during infection. What about diarrhea? Now diarrhea is more complicated because diarrhea can be beneficial for the pathogen as well as for the host. Uh, it can help you to clear it out and it can help the pathogen to spread itself. 
and Paul Ewald and others have been very helpful in, in, asking, in helping us to think uh, from that point of view about every different symptom of infection. Um, one that I studied that's very old now, and I should go back and look this up. Maybe some of you in your work groups are finding newer material. Um, he showed that in sugarlosis, a severe form of diarrhea, using low modal or something to try to treat it makes it last longer and be more likely to cause complications. It's clearly contraindicated in that kind of diarrhea. How about traveler's diarrhea? Or don't really know um, what we should be doing. These are the simplest kind of questions that people bring to their physicians every single day, and I'm afraid we really do not have the scientific evidence to give good clinical advice. <coughs> Anxiety is what I spend much of my professional life treating. Um, it's obviously really useful. Um, when something's chasing you, you'd better have an anxiety response. It helps a lot. People who complain about too much anxiety. Um, but with every defensive response, there should be a disease characterized by too little as well as too much. And it wasn't until I started thinking evolutionarily about what I was doing in the anxiety clinic that I realized that there was a whole population of patients out there who had a severe anxiety disorder who weren't coming for treatment. Their anxiety disorder was hypophobia. They don't have enough anxiety uh, to avoid crawling up on ladders and fighting in bars and, and doing drugs in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, they don't come for treatment. We have very good drugs for them, by the way. Yohimbine uh, can be used. It'll crank your anxiety level up nicely. It also reportedly gives you really, really intense orgasms. Uh, so maybe it would be attractive to some people. Um, but it's very fascinating that the population who comes for treatment is not the entire population of people who have abnormalities in their defense response. Um, for many years, I gave talks all around the country about how to treat anxiety disorders, and I always asked these researchers I was with, okay, we all know anxiety is bad. Can you show me evidence that anxiety is good? No one, could, no one does research on that. They only do research showing anxiety is bad. Finally, someone pointed me to a paper done by this fellow Poulan. I think he's a, uh, from New Zealand, right? Um, he, the, he used the Dunedin cohort, which has been used so well by others, and looked at kids who had had a severe fall with injury before the age of three. And then he followed the same kids at age 18, and he asked if they had a fear of heights. Our standard explanation for fear of heights has been that you have a bad experience, you fall, and so you learn to be afraid of heights. And here's what he found. Of those people, of those kids who had had a severe fall, fewer than 2% had a fear of heights at age 18. Of those who had never had a fall with severe, with severe injury, 12% had a fear of heights. The exact opposite of what he was predicting. What's going on here? Well, these kids didn't have enough sense to not crawl off the edge of the dining room table at age three, and they still don't have enough sense to have anxiety that will protect them from falls. These people don't have enough anxiety, and you can see it in the data. This has to do with the clinician's illusion. In the clinician's illusion, clinicians imagine that defects or that defenses are actually defects. Why? Well, because defenses are expressed when there's a problem, and they're painful, and blocking them is often safe, and it seems like fever, pain, nausea, cough, vomiting, and fatigue are not really that necessary. How serious is this? In science, it's very serious. Um, this is a paper that won the 2003 Bennett Award for biological psychiatry, and we'll just read that together with our ethological hats on. Um, they're studying rats who vary in their exposure to a cat, how they respond. Our results show that a single 10-minute exposure to a predator significantly enhanced plasma, corticosterone, and ACTH concentration, stress hormones, in maladapted, behaviorally symptomatic animals, but not in well-adapted or control rats. So essentially, the, these maladaptive rats have a stress response, and the normal, you know, robust rats don't have a stress response. So what about those normal, robust rats who, who don't have a stress response? What happens to them? That's what happens to them. Um, I mean, th this is just not biological thinking. This is proximate neurobiology, utterly unconnected uh, with thinking about the functional significance of the system that's under study. Darwin, however, knew better. Uh, Darwin says, pain or suffering of any kind, if long continued, causes depression and lessens the power of adaptation, yet it's well adapted to make a creature guard itself against any great or sudden evil. 
And there's a philosopher, actually, who has said it really almost better, I think, and that's Schopenhauer. If you're a clinician, this has got to resonate. If the immediate and direct purpose of our life is not suffering, then our existence is the most ill-adapted to its purpose in the world. And this is a lot of why I'm into this particular topic. If you're a clinician and you work in the clinic, especially in psychiatry but other areas too, it really seems like somebody had it in for us. Um, not only are they all these diseases, but almost every one of them has manifestations that make us even more miserable than we need to be made, uh, with more pain and diarrhea and suffering and cough that, that really seem to serve no purpose. So why is that? This is the mystery. Natural selection should shape near-optimal defense regulation mechanisms, but we're plagued by what appears to be excessive anxiety, pain, sadness, and other defenses. And we know from general medicine we can block these things safely. So again, why are defenses expressed excessively? The way to approach this, I finally realized, was to ask an evolutionary question. How should defenses be expressed? If natural selection shaped the exact optimal mechanism, it doesn't ever shape anything optimal, but if it did, what would that optimal mechanism look at? A first pass is that you should express an all or none defense. An all or none defense is something like vomiting. You either vomit or you don't. Panic attack, you either have a panic attack or you don't. It's a switch. Whenever the cost of the defense is less than the reduction of the harm, that is the cost of the harm without a defense minus the cost of the harm with a defense, then it's worth it and you should express the defense. Sounds good. But what if the cue is unreliable? And now we're on the African savanna, and it's evening, and you've gone down to get some water because you're thirsty and your family is thirsty, and you have to walk it back to camp, and it's a mile. And just beyond the hill on the side of the water hole, you hear a noise. And the noise is something like, Rrr. it's not loud enough so you can be sure it's a lion. It's not soft enough so you can be sure it's just a wild dog or a monkey. It's something in between. You have a decision to make, and your life depends on making it well. Should you flee, drop your water bucket and run home, or should you stay there and get your water? It depends. On the cost of a false alarm, in this case, let's say 200 calories for running away and not getting your water, the opportunity cost, the cost of a missed alarm, that is, what's the cost of the, um, a missed alarm? And the cost of a harm if there is a defense, that is, I should say, the cost of a missed alarm is the lion is there and you don't run. What's the cost of that? We'll estimate maybe 200,000 calories on average. And the cost of harm if, there, if the defense is expressed, what's the cost of harm if you run away? Because the lion is still there, but you have a much better chance of getting away if you flee. So now we're going to express the defense whenever the cost of the defense is less than the probability that the harm is actually present behind that hill minus the reduced harm from expressing the defense. Now this is what the graph looks like. And the key here is the ratio of the cost of the harm, that is the lion coming after you, versus the cost of the defense running away. If the probability of harm is down towards five, is, let's see. This is the probability of harm at which you start, should start expressing the defense. If the ratio is fairly similar, that is that the cost of the harm, the lion, is only 400 calories on average versus the 200 calories, then whenever the sound is loud enough to indicate there's a chance of a lion there being 50% or greater, you should flee. But of course, the ratio is nothing like that. The ratio is at least 20 to 1. If the ratio is 20 to 1, you should flee whenever the probability of harm is 5% or greater. And now we'll calculate it with our imaginary numbers. Is it a monkey or a tiger? Cost of fleeing 200 calories. Cost of not fleeing 200,000 calories. Ratio 1,000 to 1. So the optimum, you should flee whenever the probability of a lion is greater than 1 in 1,000. What does this mean? It means that 999 times out of 1,000, you're going to have a panic attack when there's no lion present. And that's perfectly normal. This changed my view of my clinical work. I kept seeing my patients having panic attacks in grocery stores. I said to them, listen, you've been in a grocery store 20 times without anybody doing anything nasty to you. Can't you realize it's perfectly safe? And the patients say, well, no, doctor. I, mean, I just keep having panic attacks. Can't you help me and be more sympathetic? 
Um, and this view helped me to be more sympathetic because it helped me realize that the way these mechanisms are set as is based on signal detection theory. And you're going to get a lot of false alarms. If this fellow is coming towards you, you had better run. And my favorite behavioral ecologists, Lima and Dill, have a quick summary of this. Um, few failures are as unforgiving as a failure to avoid a predator. Being killed greatly decreases your future fitness. So this is the smoke detector principle. Uh, George and I, as we worked on this, he said, listen, Randy, nobody's going to remember this unless you come up with a catchphrase. And so we finally came up with the smoke detector principle. And that's useful for patients and others because we put up with smoke false alarms on our smoke detectors because we want them to go off every single time when there's a real fire and before it gets bad. I'm going to give you a little bit more of signal detection theory, which is the underlying theory here. And I want to just point out how this science has moved. You start off with an anomaly. What's going on here? And it doesn't lead to a, to a pure evolutionary explanation. What it leaves you to is thinking about the functional significance things and what would be optimum and whether the system you're looking at is anywhere near that optimum. And this leads you to a whole other area of science, signal detection theory, which hasn't really been applied systematically here. So it's not like evolution offers you the answer, but it gives you a heuristic which tells you where to look in the rest of science to find things that are useful to make sense out of things. The gist of this, done by Green and Sweats in 66 and used everywhere ever since, is that there are four kinds of things, situations that can happen. The signal, which is the lion being there, can either be present or absent, and you can decide to either respond or not to respond. There are four kinds of outcomes. A hit, a correct detection of a lion in a flight. A false alarm, running away even though there's no lion there. A missed response, the lion is there but you don't flee. And a correct rejection, I don't think it's a lion, I don't need to flee. This is how you, you can look at it graphically to see what you really should do. The gist of it is that there is a distribution of signals from the monkey that are more quiet than the signals that come from a real danger like a lion. And you have to set a criterion. You have to set how loud does that noise have to be in, in order for you to flee. You can set it here or here or wherever. If the signal comes from a real danger, these are going to be hits and these are going to be misses. And this is the ratio we've been looking at so far. If, however, the signal comes from noise, that is, this is the actual distribution of sounds that you're hearing, then you're going to get correct rejections here and false alarms here. You've all heard about the signal to noise ratio when you buy stereo equipment. And for those of you who do signal detection work, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the key to understanding these kind of things. I found it kind of hard to understand until I finally drew this diagram for myself. Here's the distribution again. And notice that these distributions are separated by exactly one standard deviation. This means that the D prime, which is the amount of separation between the two signals, is exactly one standard deviation. It's actually two between the, the two peaks. By convention, you always set the middle point to zero so that you can look at the false po negatives on one side and the false positives on the other side. But what this illustration demonstrates is that the likelihood ratio, the noise distribution, at the criterion value. So this criterion value could shift different ways. And right here, you see that the value is about 1 to 3, 1.3. Natural selection does shape mechanisms to get you more information so, you're, and so you can better differentiate what's going on. And if most lions make really loud noises and most monkeys make really soft noises, it's much easier to discriminate. So this has to do with the D prime, which reflects how discriminable those two distributions are. This is where you put it all together, which is not nearly as complicated as it actually looks. Um, the gist of what you have in this equation is the probability of noise versus probability of signal, the value of rejecting it, value of false alarm, cost of a false alarm, cost of a hit, and the cost of a miss. You can put them all together and find the exact criterion that's optimal. And again, if this is what you're dealing with in real life, um, you really should flee, um, even if it's only a 1% chance or a 1 in 1,000 chance that the line is actually there. Notice how this applies to all kinds of things in medicine. I mean, we see all kinds of vomiting that doesn't appear to be really necessary. Uh, we see a lot of panic attacks that aren't really necessary. 
But most of the responses we look at in medicine are not all or none responses. They're graded responses. Fever, pain. There can be mild, moderate, and severe fever and pain. How can we use the same kind of approach to analyze those things? All I really have for you is a, a crude kind of a model. It's a kind of a, a project where any PhD who is doing work in physiology could take it. It'd be ideal for some people at Mount Desert Island Labs uh, because this, this fits in so beautifully with a lot of work already being done here. Um, very simple model. Think of it as fever. The cost of the fever, cost of the defense, goes up linearly with how, how high the body temperature is. Not exactly accurate, but good enough for our purposes. A little bit of fever brings down the risk of infection dramatically. So a little bit of fever brings down this cost of the harm, cost of the infection, down dramatically. But more and more and more fever doesn't help that much more. So the benefit tapers off. What we want to find is the place where the sum of the cost of the infection and the cost of the fever are minimal when they're brought together. And you can see it's right here. This is the yellow line that sums the cost of the fever and the cost of the defense. And that happens to be right at the point where the cost of the harm and the cost of the defense intersect. That's very nice. But all we have to do is tweak this a little bit to make it much more interesting. All we have to do, and the, the formula here is the cost of the defense is the level of defense times 0 .0, 0 0.05. Everything else stays the same. But now we're going to change it so that there's a baseline cost of the defense of 1 plus level of defense times 0.05. Notice what happens here. Fever goes up linearly. The cost of the, cost of the fever goes up <coughs> linearly. The cost of the harm comes down exponentially, just as it did before. But because we've bumped this up a little bit and just rejiggered the formula slightly, we now look at the optimum, the lowest point for the combined costs, and we find miraculously that the cost of the defense is worse is greater than the cost of the harm itself. I think this is very important for thinking about the problems our patients bring us. I mean, if you find people who have influenza dying from the inflammatory response and not the influenza itself, you can start making sense of it from this kind of analysis of how natural selection might be shaping those things. It has to do with the marginal benefit of increasing the fever a little bit so long, as that, so long as there's marginal benefit from increasing the fever just a little bit, the fever is going to keep going up, even to the point where the cost of that fever or inflammatory response in general is very substantially higher than the cost of the harm itself. And now we come back to influenza. I would really like to see studies that look more individually at patients with influenza, because it seems very likely to me that the reason the studies have shown equivocal results is because some people are dying mostly from the pathogen itself, Others are dying mostly from the inflammatory response, and we haven't tried to separate them out. If we could separate them out, it seems to me quite plausible we could identify those who are likely to die from the inflammation, which probably is younger people who are the most likely to die during the 1914 influenza pandemic, and we could block their inflammatory responses, while older people are less likely to die from the inflammatory response, and therefore we might well not want to interfere. Very practical application. You do not take this kind of thing and apply it directly. And some of you are trying to popularize evolutionary approaches to medicine, and I'll say probably two or three times today and in a few minutes, that evolutionary medicine does not tell you how to practice at all. Any doctor who says, I'm practicing evolutionary medicine, follow my way, you should run. Um, everything in medicine uh, that's been, you know, every ideology in medicine, you know, just causes problems. I mean, Metchnikoff was quite confident that toxins from the large bowel uh, caused all kinds of diseases, so he recommended all kinds of people cut out their large bowels and thousands of stuff. And don't follow any theory, but use your theory to ask new questions to figure out what research needs to be done. That's where progress comes. Okay. Now we take this up one level. Uh, Peter told you about mechanisms that adjust systems, such as appetite regulation, as a function of prior experience. Well, many of these defense regulation mechanisms don't just have a fixed threshold for when you should flee from a lion. You might be in a dangerous environment, or you might be in a suburban neighborhood. If you're in a suburban neighborhood, the setting for your lion flight threshold should be quite different, should be a lot higher. You, a lot, much larger noise is necessary to get you to flee if there are no lions around. And even if you're just living in the savanna, 
is there dangerous times and not so dangerous times? It's very important for a natural selection to facultatively adjust. Facultative is just jargon that means it adjusts as a function of circumstances. You should change the threshold of response intensity or duration to suit the current environment. This has big advantages and big disadvantages. And this next little section is called the perils of positive feedback. Because what you're really getting into here are certain systems where the threshold goes lower with repeated exposure to danger. And you can see how easy that would be. Um, what would be the ideal signal to lower your panic disorder threshold? Well, if yesterday you went to the watering hole and you got chased back to your camp by a lion, it would be very good tomorrow to have your threshold lower so you flee more quickly because you've just gotten information that there are a lot of lions out there. And this changes the signal to noise ratio that you should be working on. What this means, though, is that the system is prone to positive feedback. And I think what's actually going on with many of my panic disorder patients is they have a panic attack. They don't know what caused it. Their body reacts as if they've just been chased by a lion. It lowers the threshold for panic disorder further. They therefore are more on alert, more likely to have a panic attack with the least little bit of a cue. And they have another attack, which lowers it further. And it becomes a spiral in which more anxiety causes lower and lower threshold causes more and more anxiety until they end up in my clinic. So panic itself, I've been arguing, is a fight-flight response, basically. It's well adapted to get you out of life-threatening danger. And the experience of panic itself seems to downregulate the panic threshold. So any hint of danger releases a response. And when you've recently been the object of a predator attack, agoraphobia, which is fear of leaving home, is useful indeed. Now, psychiatry has hundreds of articles asking why on earth so many patients with agor it's comorbidity, we call it. Most patients with agoraphobia also have panic attacks. Why is that? Um, you know, Freud had a pretty good explanation. He thought that this was a product of mostly women who were out on the street. And he thought that these women, because he listened to them, and many of them had fantasies of being streetwalkers, prostitutes. And so he was pretty sure that when these women went out on the streets, they started having fantasies of having sex that caused anxiety, that caused panic. And that's one theory. Um, an easier theory is that when you've recently been chased by a predator, which is something that happened quite regularly back in ancestral times, uh, it would be really smart to stay home. And if you do go out, have your anxiety threshold set low, and only go out with friends. Um, and this is what our panic patients do. This explanation turns out to be very helpful for most of them. Previously, I used to tell my panic patients, oh, it's your locus ceruleus. That's where noradrenaline lives in your brain, having a storm, and it's sending off these stress signals everywhere. Yes, that's true. But again, at the end of that, they would say to me, thank you very much, doctor. I think I'll go see a cardiologist. It seems like a heart problem to me. Um, now, when I explain it this way, they say, oh, that makes sense. Um, we need both evolutionary and proximate explanations for things, and our patients find them very useful. Immune responses are another area, and again, I'm just going to label what I'm doing for the next couple of minutes speculation, because that's what it is. I don't want to make claims for these ideas, but I do think they're interesting ideas that other people might well be able to develop. Uh, one exposure develops a response, a second exposure, arouses a faster, stronger response. Now, that's not really how you get anaphylaxis. Um, the, in fact, the immune system has remarkable systems to protect itself from you know, over-expressing uh, immune responses, but occasionally it does. Nausea and vomiting is an interesting one. I don't know how many of you had your first experience with alcohol with peppermint schnapps, uh, but a number of my friends did. Uh, and those poor people who did you know, have lost the pleasure of peppermint for decades. And it just takes a single exposure to peppermint schnapps and extended vomiting uh, to really wreck otherwise nice life pleasures. Um, essentially, signal detection theory and the smoke detector principle explain the generalization to related odors, and repeated exposure increases the sensitivity. Uh, much of my early research clinically was on conditioned nausea and vomiting in the chemotherapy clinic. I would get consultations from doctors saying, young woman vomiting before she ever enters the clinic and gets shots, clearly hysteria, please use psychotherapy. And I would go talk with this young woman and she would explain that the first two times she went for her chemotherapy, she noticed an odd chemical smell in the building, which was actually there. And 
after you know, she got her shot, she started vomiting terribly. And guess what? The third time she came back, she started vomiting before she ever went in. This is a conditioned nausea and vomiting response. Very simple. And the right treatment for this is not to tell the patient that they need to get into their unconscious. Uh, the right treatment for this is, first of all, to get rid of the smell in the building, uh, which we did, which was very helpful. And we also told our patients to quit eating their favorite foods before they came for therapy. Uh, eat foods you don't like. Um, or if, for instance, you really want to get over your chocolate addiction, uh, this is your big chance. Uh, have chocolate just before. So implications for an evolutionary view of defense regulation. It's a theoretical foundation for much of what goes on in general medicine. But most of the research, I think, has yet to be done. And that's why I'm giving a, a large focus on this topic for this particular meeting. I'm hoping some people here will either be interested in pursuing this or have students who would like to pursue this line of research. It's also an essential foundation for pharmacology. And I think it addresses the question of whether a pharmacological utopia is possible. A very important question, especially for those of us in psychiatry. Is it possible? Well, most suffering, I submit, is, at least in modern circumstances, normal but unnecessary in the individual instance. There are lots of false alarms. There's lots of repeated arousal changing thresholds. And the modern environment is remarkably safe, both in physical dangers and infection and all the rest. So we should be able to safely block most defenses and suffering and make life a lot better for people, except for that one time in 100 when the defense will be essential. So I don't want us going out and telling physicians, OK, it's safe to block defenses. I don't want us going out and telling physicians, watch out. When you block defenses, you're interfering with the natural mechanism. Physicians and researchers need a more subtle approach to this. They need to recognize how natural selection has, using signal detection principles, shaped the responses that are, bring most patients into the clinic. That's the part about physiology. I've got a couple of minutes left. I'll give, have a little bit of time for questions as well. But I just want to make the point that when we deal with emotional disorders, it's fundamentally the same problem. This will be pretty quick and no, no depth here. There's not, that might be next year. Um, emotions, uh, actually, this is a paragraph that Ed Wilson uh, wrote in sociobiology that had a huge influence on me in 1975 when the book came out. Um, I was in, you know, school treating patients on a psychiatry ward, not knowing really what I was doing, very confused by it all. And he writes, love joins hate, aggression, fear, expansiveness, withdrawal, and so on, in blends designed not to promote the happiness of the individual, but to favor the maximum transmission of the controlling genes. Ideological wars led him to take this out of subsequent editions of sociobiology, but I think he was exactly right here. And it helped me to recognize that what I was dealing with were emotions that were useful for the person's genes. So then I tried to study emotions theory and look at how they're categorized. And what I found was really a pre-biological war that's been going on for 100 years about how to classify emotions. Some people say there are certain basic emotions. Others people say there are dimensions. Other people organize them on a circumplex. I mean, our human minds really demand categories with some kind of simple principle. Um, but what if we ask the question about how selection has actually shaped the emotions? Uh, this is a basic emotions view, anger, anticipation, joy, acceptance, fear, surprise, standard kind of things. And this is another basic emotions view. Notice that every single expert has their own list of basic emotions. Uh, this is very good for exam questions, but it's not very good for actual scientific understanding. There's something wrong here if all the experts disagree on what the basic emotions are. As a result, some people have given up on that, and they try to code the emotions inter or place the emotions on a two-dimensional axis, usually a positive affect, negative affect, high arousal, low arousal. And that works to some extent, uh, but not all that well. Um, some things just don't fit, and you know, it's a very artificial kind of scheme for organizing the emotions. So this is, I spent a while thinking about it and thought, what if you take a phylogenetic approach? And this is really, again, just a fantasy but at least helps you to think about what emotions are in terms of their organisms. Back with one-celled organisms, there are two things a bacteria can do. It can swim towards or away from a particular stimulus. And in fact, you, we have here two global categories of emotions, positive ones, opportunities, promotion, excitement, positive, and negative ones, threat, prevention, apprehension, and negative feeling. 
And then they gradually get differentiated into the exact kind of positive situation or the exact kind of negative situation, such as opportunities for material or physical satisfaction, mates, social status and allies, all the different dangers, kinds of losses, social losses, physical uh, damage and all the rest. The really important thing here is that these clusters of leaves at the top all overlap each other. This idea that basic emotions are completely separate from each other is not really a very biological idea. They emerge from each other, um, and gradually and only partially. This idea that they're all in dimensions doesn't fit very well either. This tree also is not all that accurate because it implies there's one endpoint of some sort, and of course there's not. There are different emotional states for all different organisms depending on the kinds of circumstances that they need to cope with. So this is just to give you a, a hint about how one can go about trying to understand emotions and their dysregulations, which are the emotional disorders, using a biological framework. I think I have time for about two or three questions. I'd appreciate those, and then we'll go to our break. Please. Right. You know, do you know an article on that? I mean, there are a couple of articles on the widespread use of, of histamine inhibitors that decrease your stomach acid. Some people take two or three of these a day, uh, and some internists insist that their patients take them uh, to prevent Barrett's esophagus cancer and other kinds of things. Um, and the studies I know of show that people who take these things regularly are more likely to develop osteoporosis because they don't absorb calcium as well. Um, prior studies showing that people who did not have acid-secreting cells in their stomach were more likely to